stuff for this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I'm an expert in human driven fire. So I look at human caused fire. And even over the summer, last summer, I was asked to give testimony, and that's a screenshot of me trying to read uh, mm -hmm. my written testimony to the um, congressional hearing on the state of federal wildlife rights. And my uh, testimony was used in tandem with three other experts to help write this bill that was going to be passed to fund all federal wildlife rights. And this is the so, um, it is important, I would say, to do this very fancy thin diagram of science, policy, and, and diplomacy. And those people who know me in real life are generally really surprised when I see that diplomatic things in my career. So personally, maybe not so much, but that is a good place to be. And we'll see why that's important to me. So please feel free to interrupt me in person. You can raise your hand um, on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, you can submit a question. So, uh, I, I would imagine that we're kind of seeing this throughout. Uh, where is the big data in this presentation? It's on every slide. So you'll be able to find it and think about it. So we can conceptualize that. Um, and then who are the policymakers? While a lot of this is local, and I know here in Western US and in Western North America, we tend to talk about communities, the national scale. When we talk about the Arctic Council, it's really a supranational organization. There are eight Arctic states. So Starting with um, Iceland, Denmark, and Sweden, Greenland, and Greenland is probably uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, the Russian Federation, the US because of Alaska, and Canada. And there's also six um, indigenous permanent participants. Here they are represented with their flag. Um, and then there are uh, not only member states, but permanent observers and an ad hoc observers. And those observers tend to be states. But there are also some non non governmental organizations that are involved in this as well. So it's a lot of moving parts, and everyone is interested in not just policy informing, but policy making. And particularly now, we have to focus on fire. You know, and why is that? Well, this is a tweet from the um, Arctic Council this morning talking about the IPCC report that was released yesterday. Yesterday or the day before? Um, yesterday. It's Showing that one of the things that tends to get lost is that the Arctic is actually warming faster than anywhere on Earth. Which means that we have to, you know, to contend with the important issues sooner rather than later. And of course, the Arctic is really important for global processes as well. Another thing to consider, this is from the NOAA um, Arctic Report Card from 2020, is that we're seeing not only increased fire activity, which we'll see shortly in another slide, but that fuels are becoming more plentiful and sooner. So on the bottom, you can see that that's June. That's June. These are places where there's still snow through May. And by June, they're already planted. So we have not just an issue of emissions, but an issue of food. This is from the report released last week from Nina and Greg Arendelle, showing how um, extreme fires um, are starting to be not exceptions in the Arctic, but considered to be just a summer episodic phenomenon. So we should expect extreme fires in the Arctic in the summer. Like that's different. Um, I one time uh, when I first started working on the Greenland wildfires in 2017. Uh, a side note to all all of our early career people here: that when a journalist is talking to you, they are recording everything you say, and I. Kind of said that if someone had told me when I was an undergrad um, in the 2000s that I would be working on fire in Greenland, in Greenland, I would say I don't believe you. Okay, uh, but but here we are. Okay, um, and so this is also a part um, of this setting the stage for our society. All right, so this is a figure that I adapted from. In room. <laughs> yes. If you want to just like step back, it's like no, it's just like camera, it's doing some weird stuff. It's like not capturing the face at oh. all. Well. Yeah. Sure okay. <laughs> all right. Good. Okay. So the reason I like to show this is that um, when I introduce the the term of fire regime to policymakers, this is actually a really good way to don't get yourself. So even though 
even though this was written for a scientific community in mind, they understand the initial flame in the fire. They understand that fire behavior is because of these landscape components. And that fire regimes are then changing right, from decade to decade. So what we propose as part of one of our expert groups of the R6 monitoring and assessment program for our example, is that really what policymakers are often interested in is my addition to this, which is fire emissions. And this is both quantity, transport, and rate. And it's often at region scale. While they care about single events, it's more about state level. And they are often interested not only in years, but months. So daily extreme events are important for public health, but actually doing reporting and um, types of conferencing for policymakers for official emissions inventories, they want to go months and years. That's it. Right. So we can think about linking the fire change the fire regime changes in the fire emissions as well. Okay, so why do we care about smoke in the northern high latitude? This is actually fairly settled science. Um, you know, we know that uh, short-lived climate forces like black carbon and methane, and even hydrofluorocarbons, um, that they are these powerful climate forces that are uh, helping to speed up some of the localized emissions. Particularly for black carbon, we know that in the late winter and early spring, so right now, when there is burning at basically 40 degrees north, that, that smoke has a potential um, to basically be pooled into the Arctic um, through this polar dome, polar dome phenomenon. So any early season fires, smoke is high enough above the growth cost, has potential to go to the Arctic. So it's not just fires, of course, are the only sources. Um, and, if, and in fact, we know that um, industry, transportation, energy um, are important sources as well. But this Arctic haze event and the deposition of black carbon on ice, particularly sea ice from Arctic, leads to get a double heating effect. So that the sea ice is melting through the top because of black carbon and then melting from all sides of the And if you've ever taken um, a dark sea towel to a white sand beach, you understand the albedo, right? You, your towel will be the hottest. The other thing that policymakers are concerned about um, are the uh, transboundary pollution sources. So here is an example of fire um, from October of this past year. Spring, uh, smoke from mainly California, but parts of Idaho as well, coming into southern Canada. And then fires in Alberta uh, that is transporting smoke to the Great Lakes. So essentially, we're smoking Canada and then we're smoking Canada. We're getting these transboundary effects. And oftentimes, this is not captured well in official inventories or emissions models, where we only say where did the fire start, what, what burned, and what was in Okay, so part of our work then was to create a uh, review paper around Arctic fire regimes as part of the expert group for earth climate. I have one of my co-authors here in the room with me. And what we wanted to do was to think about what had been published across the eight Arctic states, what were the fire regimes as known, and what were the emissions, and what potentially would this look like by mid-century and end of century. And so what we found is that consistently the research shows um, almost a mirror image here, as you can see. In North America, we see a shift in with boreal tundra to dry heat, agriculture expanding north, boreal forest to grasslands, and increased lightning. Similarly, in the Nordic countries, instead of Scandia, into European Russia and um, Asian Russia, we see coniferous to deciduous, which decreases fire. Um, and then boreal tundra to dry heat, expansion of agriculture north. In fact, in Siberia, they're already growing. Um, corn has 70 degrees north in certain places. That's pretty high. <laughs> but remember, um, they have the tree line, which extends past there in parts of Siberia as well. 
well. The forest is deaf under the taiga. And then um, uh, there is a pattern here that has been noticed in the party of taiga uh, permafrost thaw. And at that moment when it thaws, it would decrease the fire from the wet to them. And then as it becomes dry, the fire could be. Um, and this is actually just some conflicting studies here, but right now it's pointing in this direction. We find that long-term emissions are going up. And what's really important for the CFED and GFAS and SPEND, which are established emissions models, and SPEND was actually developed here by um, Christine Biedemeyer. We see that, that there is a that there's more fire occurring above 60 degrees north than in the super sun since the mid 2000s. Then is the only one that shows basically that it hasn't changed, but we do see an increase in just the active fire detection as well. And that these fire emissions are important. And when we're compared to other anthropogenic sources of black carbon, that extreme fire years, so just take 2020 for example, that it outpaces flaring for natural gas extraction. Um, Residential and transport at both 50 and 60 degrees. So, why do these small human caused fires, what do they mean to black carbon transport? So, these are wetlands burning in, in Plaza Republic at the end of April. This is before there's convective activity. It's unlikely to be lightning small fires. So, what are the emissions for these two fires? Uh, so, we you'll see a lot of comparison of signal to. Motors and beers. The reason being is that we have now, with Sentinel and Landsat, these moderate resolution data that can show us exactly where the fires are, uh, but we don't have necessarily the same access to that data as we do to source all this. Does that make sense to everyone? If you use active fire data, you understand it comes to your phone, use it every day if you want. But the higher resolution data, this is an, um, uh, in and here you can see the fire is actually starting in the agricultural landscape. It's spreading into the external parts of land. Because the farmers are burning and then simply do not maintain the fire. They just allow it to burn. And burning wetlands is kind of a way of doing no control. And so kind of this like secondary benefit. Okay. So this is a problem. So locally, what that meant is last. Spring that own and the Here's images from those. They have they call them um, black air days. So bad quality, bad, bad air quality from these types of fires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, we now have it on the east coast too because of fires. So these are fires from the my very first slide. This is um, almost one in Saco Republic. This is sometimes called the ice deck of the world. This is the um, farthest north permanently occupied coldest place in the world. And yet, there are fires now. Great. This is from May 1st. And suspiciously, the fires are <laughs> geometric in shape. Um, so there's some uh, Question as to how these fires started. Yes, it was a warm spring, but again, the floor conductive activity would be small. So it's unlikely to be light. Um, and while it is an occupied region, we're still talking very low populations, very, very low, uh, that are not well connected to the outside world. You fly here. Okay, so this is where almost one looks like. Almost in the fire. So let's just track it. Let's take that fire, and this is from my colleague at Alternative Atmosphere Monitoring Service. This is the smoke plume, and here we're looking at PM2.5. Um, so we just go quickly and watch that smoke plume and then um, within 48 hours, the smoke plume is now in the East Siberian. So yes, it has a potential for black carbon deposition. We say that because just because there's smoke in the air doesn't mean it's going to cause it, right? There has to be some kind of um, atmosphere that's scavenging it that causes it to drop. So there's a potential. So on the next slide, this is from Dr. Zach Lake at Colorado State University. And let's close that. And if we click play, and just to orient everyone, the East Siberian Sea is approximately so, um, so, here. Okay. so let's play through the 
This is just for April. And the middle of April, already, at the end of April, are already starting to see the crack up of ice here. This is the very interesting. Early melt, we don't see it in other places. And these are locations that were, um, that had solid ice through the middle of May, just in the early 2000s. So very rapid changes in the cryosphere here. And a location where we know these early spring fires are likely um, to have a potential for rock fire. Which brings me to some work from my colleagues um, at Greenpeace Russia. They led. So um, I always like to give this disclaimer. Greenpeace Russia has never asked me to sign a petition or hand me a clipboard. They mainly do um, environmental research that perhaps uh, is not available from the official federal agencies. So a lot of their work is open source, is published, is peer reviewed, um, and they're trying to do some environmental work that say it's in Canada the Canadian culture. Okay, or in the US, maybe um, the National Trade Agency fire safety. Right. So what we did was to um, recruit, we got to publish an URL at the end of last year. We recruited more than 700 online volunteers in Russia, trained them how to do mapping, and we used the Sentinel database um, on Amazon Web Services, and they hand drew every fire that found in January. So that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's why there were 700. Um, so my role was um, to observe how they were doing the training, and then um, I co-led the validation effort. We did a very like statistically driven, and that's what our colleague um, Stephen Damon um, has done a lot of work on how to do improved um, statistical assessment of large geospatial data. So he created two validation protocols and these policies. This is what the online um, portal looks like. Here I'm a validator. So I'm going to where someone has drawn the polygon and I'm determining whether or not, yes, that should be a fire. Um, this is in um, uh, Rostov Oblast, which is actually not too far from Ukraine. It's one of the um, most agriculturally productive oblasts in Russia. And while farmers here have traditionally burned fields in the spring, there has been a decrease in uh, farmers burning of um, cropland in the spring and the transition to summer burning post harvest. So we're now seeing an increase in wetland areas between the field and the field. I gotta tell you, we saw nothing about this. There's nothing in the science of literature, the English or Russian. There's nothing in the documents in Russian. We don't know what it is. So if someone would like to investigate that, we would be happy. <laughs> so this is an example of kind of the complexity that we're dealing with. So let's compare this. We found about for the American people, 33 million acres burnt in the spring in Russia. In California, from Cal Fire, an extreme year in 2020, 4.1 million. Last year, 2.5. That means and I love making this slide, that it's burning an area larger than Alabama, but not quite Arkansas. Every spring. Every spring. And so why mass these spring fires? Well, one of the things that we did was we went back through the Duma, the Russian um, parliament, and the codified law. And what we found was that no federal agency is actually responsible for these fires, for monitoring them, for putting them out, for even knowing where they are, like knowing that they exist. For these 33 million acres, they're important. So what does that mean, this large data set that we have? Why is this important policy? Well, all of this fire that we see, it is missing from the UN FCCC report. It's not a part of the copy of the treaty. And um, it, it, it can't even be presented as part of the mission. Okay. So 
know, when we talk about how are we going to um, account for carbon sinks in Russian forests, we are not adequately accounting for carbon sources in, in the Russian landscape yet. So keep that in mind. And this data set, by the way, is open for you to download it if anyone would like to. This shows the types of burning um, across. We did, for this study, we actually omitted the Arctic. I argued against the government to include the Arctic. <laughs> um, and we will, in the next round, include all of the Russian Federation. Well, agricultural lands are important. They're not the only source. In fact, wetlands, abandoned lands, are very significant sources. Um, abandoned lands were uh, communal agricultural before perestroika in the early 1990s, um, and which they became essentially no longer economically feasible. And so they're essentially unmanaged reforestation. If we just look in and around Moscow, we find that actually abandoned lands um, are most um, of the fire. And this actually has to do, here's a little social science for you today. This has to do with the tax code. If your land is burned, you will not be fined for unmanaged land, and you don't have to pay additional debt. Now, I'm sure the tax code was written as a way to try to increase management of land, but instead a perverse incentive has been formed for people who work land. So this isn't necessarily a human behavior with fire issue as much as a human behavior with tax. Okay, so now I want you to choose your own adventure. In our review paper um, by the expert group on Portland Climate Forces for the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, these were the top five uncertainties that we found. Now, you're an Arctic policymaker. Which one do you think is most alarming? Is green My co author can't. So, which one do you think? Okay, so Bill says three. Permafrost, that is one. Yeah. Why is permafrost one? Yeah, about in the so in the high northern latitude, about half of all peatlands overlap with permafrost. So it's not all like sometimes we use these these terms interchangeably and that's not correct. But about half. Right? So that's a problem. Anybody else want to guess? Why do you think number, that would be a problem? The lack of agreement between official statistics and our satellite, our big data driven model. Because then they can't really make good policy to address climate change if they don't know right. what the carbon is going to be. Or the air quality. Or, you know. <laughs> okay, and then let's be a little more simple. If you decide that, oh, why, why should we trust that satellite data anyway? It doesn't align with our statistics. There's no like institutional buy in, and so you can't actually do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, I, and so, you, just so you know, one of the reasons we are here visiting these at Team Boulder is because we're, this is work that uh, a sub factor of our group, a subset of our group, is going to continue working. You want to know, you want to know, or at least understand why. So we have an answer to the policy. It's not just a, yeah, sorry, satellite big data. Yeah, it's not 100% certain. That's not enough, right? That's not enough to really be. Okay, so and I'll just highlight some text. I'm not going to read it all to you. Basically, what we find is that when this mis mismatch occurs, um, we could not find exact reasons. There's nothing from this the official statistics side. There's nothing in the you know the FAQs or ATD documents, satellites, and the engineering aspects of the product tell us why. We do know that uh, work done by the GWIS group, um, the Global Wildland um, System, the EU funded one, they find that over more than a decade of data, the official records um, are more likely to align as the fire size. Right? So smaller 
fires as larger fires can be better captured in those data sources. Um, but we really, we really don't know. And we actually say that we need to improve them. We're going to use these large sources of satellite data. We need to know why and how we do it. So a good example here, if we do take this global wildfire information, which is often used for reporting any human expectations by EU countries. So here we just take three border countries, Norway, Sweden, and Spain. And what we find is that for Norway and Finland, for the year 2019, there's an over estimation by the satellite data. But that for Sweden, there's an under estimation. Not even the same story, right? We're, like, we're not getting the same value sequence. So let's take an example here, and I hope to visit all of you up in May. So this is from last summer. This is about Local fire department that stuff fire reported it at just over 310 hectares. And this is a, uh, a forest that is owned uh, by a church. I went and took all of the physical data I could find at 10 meters, so as the fire is starting, as it is ending. And then several times I hand drew this polygon and then I hand drew it again until I got this average. So that's only 230 hectares. That's which is less, right, than estimated by officials. And I'm using some of the highest resolution data that I can get my hands on, right? So this is still a deep one. It's my 1990s PowerPoint here. So there's an underestimation. Okay, so here's another question. Is there a standard and or operational global burn barrier product in the No. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Siberia, 
we want to do this in a way that doesn't set any community or individual assumptions. Right? So we want to collect the data. That's not only right, that it has a collective benefit, but it's also ethical. You know, we're not trying to put anyone under the magnifying glass. Technically, those fires are all illegal. Right. All the fires are illegal. So, what about what do we know about indigenous burning in Antarctica? This is from Sweden. Um, I love reindeer, so I will always go to Sweden. Basically, over time, if you have a short term big fire, you get to a So, you get this top right picture, right, where the light is faster. No longer viable. But if you do long term small fires, you actually may get a pause in where the reindeer will come and, and forage. But over time, you get this open landscape and a nice life and passion. Okay. And so this is actually known. Um, this is work done by social scientists in Sweden, where they worked with the Sami, and they found that the Sami. Would advocate for burning um, small fires to promote summer pastures in order to maintain the long term availability of winter pastures because that's when the reindeer really needs right? it. Um, and in fact, in the Sami language, the word roba, like roba the um, means fire or a place that has burned. So the place, so if you're into like geography, place names, or place names, that's one of the, the original um, Another example from our colleagues is the Gorshin Council <coughs> National Collector, which is one of the six indigenous permanent participants of the Arctic Council. Um, they, the Ed Alexander and Douglas Bridge had to look there. They find that early season burns, small burns, when there's still snow on the timberline, so that will increase caribou. Right? So schools are going to reindeer, no one's hurting them. Um, but it increases caribou. But if you get late season wildfires, it increases caribou. Okay. So, and this is taken from the Arctic Council Wildland Fire Case. This is Edo. You find that, um, that this indigenous knowledge about fire is helpful not only for preventing wildfires, but for biodiversity. Okay. So, there are these other now, we as data scientists may want this information, right, in particular, climate change, because I want to know that there may be spring fires. We really need to care for, right? For in this diagram, fires are not the only source of late winter, early spring. That's true. So is transportation, right? So is energy extraction. Um, so, what we don't want to do is come up with a data driven methodology that somehow targets cultural or indigenous land as a bad source during the spring and is something to be eliminated because it has these other benefits as well. But I think we don't want to do that. I don't want to do that because I want to support my career. So, whatever that pay, 